ahead and get started. I got, I got a lot of things I want to talk about. Um, the first thing that I want to talk about that, that I think is a really helpful way to get into this topic that I think kind of hits on a lot of stuff that goes wrong in tech. It's actually something that happened, uh, after I wrote the book. It happened a few months ago and it was an update that went out into some users of Google Maps. Um, uh, this is a bunch of Google Maps users in the United States received this update where um, when you were looking up directions somewhere, in addition to getting the normal information, so, you know, uh, the distance, the route, how long that might take you to walk versus how long that might take you if you took public transit or drove, um, what Google Maps started doing was also telling you how many calories it thought you might burn if you walked instead of taking a different form of transit. And what they started doing was they didn't just give you the calorie count, they also told you how many mini cupcakes you might burn if you walked, based off of what they thought the calorie count was of a mini cupcake. Now, I don't know what they mean by a mini cupcake. I am from America. <laughs> I suspect it was not a very small cupcake. I don't know. I actually I don't know, right? Like, what is a mini cupcake? I don't know. Um, but also, there's some there's some issues that arose with this. So, in fact, there's a, a, a journalist named Taylor Lawrence who started tweeting about this the night that the update went out onto her phone. Around 8 p.m., she's like, whoa, look at this new thing that's happening on Google Maps. Now let's walk through her process. She looks at this and she's like, wow, this is a thing. Oh my God, if you click walking directions, it tells you how much food you'd burn. What the fuck? Mm -hmm. And then she keeps on going and she's like, okay, I can't turn this feature off. And this could be really triggering to somebody with an eating disorder. And then she goes on to talk about how calorie counts are oftentimes really inaccurate. She talks about like why, why mini cupcakes. She talks about just sort of like the perpetuation of diet culture. This goes on for about an hour. That she, she goes through all the ways in which this particular update was a miss for her. So to recap, these are all of the these are the critiques that she had. Some of these are slightly edited in terms of word choice from from her original language. <laughs> you can guess which ones. Um, but she says, okay, first off, there is no way to turn this feature off. It's not even that you can you you're not even opting into it. And then even worse, you cannot opt out of it. There's no way to turn it off. This could be dangerous to somebody with an eating disorder. It just generally feels shamey and bad. Average calorie counts might not be meaningful. Uh, not all calories are created equally. And then, you know, she talks about like a cupcake being a bad metric and the way that cupcakes are encoded as being sort of like a very feminine and white and middle class type of food. And so she walks through all of these different problems, right? So let me just reiterate here. One hour. In one hour, she had walked through all of that. Within three hours, they actually shut the feature down. So I think about this little example. I think about it a lot. And I think about a question that many of us could probably start to like scratch out an answer to. How long do you think they spent building that? More than three hours. I will tell you that they spent more time than that deciding like which illustration of the cupcake to use or like what the frosting should look like. Like sprinkles or no sprinkles? Should the frosting be pink or should the frosting be white with the, with the pink sprinkles and the blue sprinkles? Like those are the conversations that took more than three hours. So you had some number of people in a room working together, working separately on the different pieces of this project for some period of time, and nowhere along the way did any of those potential failures that would make this a problem for real people either come up, or if they did come up, the people who brought them up weren't listened to, and they weren't empowered to actually make a change in what the product was doing. So I think about this constantly as sort of like, a perfect encapsulation of what I think goes wrong in tech a lot. I think what we end up having all of the time is sort of these kind of small, but ultimately potentially very harmful decisions that get built into the technology that we make. And we end up with these, these products that I, I kind of think of as having a little bit of like tech knows best paternalism, where it's like, oh no, no, you didn't say you wanted a calorie counter, but we know better. You said you wanted to map directions, but we know that what you actually need is to track your health. And you know, there were lots and lots of people who said, well, but you know, people need to be healthier and people need to get exercise. And that may or may not be true, but that's sort of like a totally other issue, right? It's like, I signed up for this product to do X and you told me that I now had to do Y in a way that could cause real problems. So. 
I started looking at a lot of examples like this uh, when I was working on this book, and I, I get sent them all the time now. It's kind of great and terrible, um, of ways that tech products really leave people out and that cause kind of havoc large and small in their lives. And I think so much of it really comes from a very narrow understanding of who and what is normal. And I think we oftentimes use the terms like normal people, and that ends up meaning people like us or people like me. And so we see all of these products that kind of fall apart when anybody who's not who the, the designers expected start using them. For example, this is a notification that my friend Dan Hahn got from his scale, um, which because he has a smart scale. And so they send these weekly emails. Now, you'll notice that the name on here is not Dan. It's Calvin. Calvin is his toddler son. Don't be discouraged by last week's results. We believe in you. Let's set a weight goal to help you shed those extra pounds. Calvin weighs more every single week. <laughs> and, and so the, the thing is, right, this product did not recognize that there were other reasons you would use a scale besides weight loss. Like literally the only reason that it understood was you must be trying to lose weight, right? Or that losing weight is always a positive thing. Because it wasn't even just this one notification he got. He actually got this other notification. Um, this one was actually meant for his wife. So it's a push notification. And it says, congratulations, you've hit a new low weight. Now, in Dan's example, his wife had happened to have just had a baby. <laughs> which, uh, I, it was exciting. So congratulations for that. But when you think about a message like this, can you think about all of the ways that this might hit a really wrong note? I mean, I have friends who have chronic illnesses where when they lose weight, that is a signal that they're getting sick. I've had friends who have gone into long-term treatment for eating disorders and where they spend a lot of time, a lot of time trying not to hang out and think about, am I at my lowest weight? Or should I be feeling better about myself because I weigh less, right? Like that is something that they had to like learn to let go of and that they work on every day. And so to look at this and to think like, oh, we should necessarily be congratulating people just because they're at a new low weight seems like so un, like, unthinkingly narrow. And yet we do this stuff constantly. We see it all over the place. In fact, some of you probably uh, saw this um, a couple of years ago now. Um, my friend Eric Meyer had this terrible experience with Facebook where he went online on Christmas Eve to kind of check in and see what's going on with family. And he's expecting, right, like the normal stuff, people opening presents and well wishes. And what he sees instead is uh, an ad for something called Year in Review. Year in Review was brand new that year. And what Year in Review does is it takes your highlights of the past year. So what are the top photos and videos and things like that that you've posted, packages them up in a little album, and then serves them back up to you. And so when it did that, it took the most popular photo that he had posted all year and put it at the top of the album, inserted it into his feed and said, hey, Eric, here's what your year looked like. And what they wanted him to do was look at that little album they created. And then, of course, they want you to share it, right? Because they want that engagement. The thing is, that photo in the center of his profile, that is his daughter, Rebecca. His daughter, Rebecca, had died on her sixth birthday that year of an aggressive brain cancer. It was the most interacted with photo he'd posted all year because it was the photo he posted right after she died. It was not a photo that he wanted to be reminded of. It was not a photo that he asked to be reminded of. And it was not something he wanted to celebrate with Facebook's illustrations of people dancing at a party all inserted around it. It was a really awful experience. So here's the thing, though. This was a couple years ago. After this happened, Facebook invited him on campus to talk about it. The product manager apologized to him. And you think, like, gosh, there's a lot of really kind, smart people who are working there who legitimately do not want things like this to happen. But you know, actually, they're doing the same stuff right now. I mean, they're doing a lot right now. We can talk about that later, too. But a couple of months ago, um, this is something that Olivia Salon, who's a journalist, she's, uh, she works for The Guardian, I believe, posted. Um, what it is, it's a screenshot of um, an Instagram ad. So what, let me just break down what's going on in here, because there's, there's a lot happening. So Olivia had received an email. The email had contained graphic rape threats. She's a journalist who writes about technology. 
She wanted to post this publicly because she wanted people to see the kind of abuse that women who are public online often get. So she posted it to her Instagram account. Instagram is owned by Facebook. Facebook wants more people who use Facebook to also use Instagram. So Facebook will take your Instagram photos and insert them onto your friends' Facebook pages as advertisements to try to entice them to use Instagram also. So what Facebook had done was realize that this photo was a heavily engaged with photo. Lots of people commented on this photo. So they took it and they inserted it into an ad and put it on her friends' profiles. A graphic rape threat packed, packaged up in this peppy little bow, right? Now I look at this and I think like, well shit, this is the same thing that they did before, right? Like it's different, but it's the same. It's the same thing where they take content that was posted in a totally different context, extract it, and try to use it to increase engagement by putting that in front of your, your friends and your family. And they do that without understanding or without caring that this can go really wrong. And they do that because for years, Facebook has spent pretty much all of its energy laser focused on what are we gonna do to allow our product to be used by more people, to be more engaging to advertisers, right? And they've spent very little time actually dealing with these potential negative implications. And so I look at examples like this and I think a lot about this quote from Zeynep Tufekci. She's a, a, a digital sociologist. Um, if you're not familiar with her, her work, I would definitely look her up. Where she says, you know, Silicon Valley is run by people who want to be in the tech business, but they are in the people business, and they are in way, way over their heads. And I think about that for all of us. I think that Silicon Valley can kind of be like placeholder for sort of like the heart of some of these problems, but they certainly affect all of us. I live in Philadelphia. You are all here in Australia, but I would say this about all of us, right? Like we often spend our time thinking that we are in the tech industry, but most of what we do is really about working with people. And we have underinvested in understanding the people that we are designing things for. And we've underinvested in acknowledging the potential harm that our work can have. And that is starting to have problems that run really deep. There's the stuff that's at that interface level, the kind of surface level that I think can be problematic enough. But then we get into all of these other places where bias starts to take hold and can cause some really big problems. I'm gonna talk about just a couple of those tonight. <coughs> One of those um, is in images. So for example, this is um, a selfie that a woman named Grace took using a filter in Snapchat a while back. The filter was called anime. This does not look like anime. What this looks like, uh, and what a lot of Asian Americans at least said, this looks like yellow face. And so, which is the term for um, white people masquerading as Asians, like putting on stereotype Asian costumes, Asian makeup. You got sort of like the slanty eyes and the uh, buck teeth. And, you know, I look at this and I think it looks a lot more like something that we wouldn't, wouldn't do now, even in, even in Hollywood, which isn't necessarily known for always being the most progressive, which is like, this is Mickey Rooney playing Iwai Yunioshi in uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. And so Snapchat said after this happened, they were like, oh, well, we're not gonna put this filter out again. But they didn't apologize for it and they didn't really see what was wrong with it or they wouldn't at least acknowledge publicly that like making filters that dress up as other races is maybe an issue. And then, you know, when you look at the kinds of things that they've done over time, in fact, it's not that uh, abnormal. Because a couple months before that, on April 20th, which is uh, 420, uh, which, I don't know, is that is 420 a cultural reference, Australia? Yeah. So, okay, yeah. Um, for anybody who is not familiar, uh, so that would be like the, like the marijuana smoking holiday, um, colloquially, right? So, so for 420, they released this thing they called the Bob Marley filter. And what the Bob Marley filter did is it darkened your skin and gave you dreadlocks. And people were very immediately like, no, 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 this is called blackface. Like, you don't dress up as a black person, um, so why would you create a filter that makes you look like a black person? Like, don't, don't do this, right? And again, they really did not want to apologize or did not want to acknowledge that there is anything wrong with this. And we can see these kinds of problems then get even at a deeper level in our software. So for example, um, just last year, there was an app that came out called FaceApp. I don't know if any of you played with it. It was really hot for like a month. And it did things like this. You could create a younger version of yourself or you could create like a older version of yourself or a hotter version of yourself. 
And so you would take your selfie and it would show you this like hot version, right? So when you use the hotness filter, what people realized was that it also made your skin lighter and it would do things like narrow the bridge of your nose to have like a more European looking nose. And it would, you know, do all the other things you might expect, like smooth out your skin or get rid of wrinkles or that kind of stuff, right? And so you see here people started commenting like, wait, why is the hotness filter making me into a mediocre white guy? <laughs> um, but, th but the thing is, like, you look at something like this, and it's kind of funny, but you look at why this happened. Here's why it happened. They actually told us why it happened. The CEO apologized for it. He said, you know, we're deeply sorry for this unquestionably serious issue. It is an unfortunate side effect of the underlying neural network caused by the training set bias, not intended behavior. So I'm going to un unpack that a little bit. <laughs> so what he's saying is this is an unfortunate side effect. So, oops. <laughs> and that they didn't mean to, right? But what's actually happening, when he says that it is a side effect of the underlying neural network caused by the training set bias, what he is saying is, well, we fed the system a bunch of pictures of white people that we thought were attractive, and that's how it learned what attractiveness was. So it was fed a body of work, right, of white people, that it said, here, here is what hotness looks like. Learn, learn at, the, at this set here, right? And so it learned, it learned as best as it could, right? And so in fact, I would say it's not that it's not intended behavior. In fact, it is functioning exactly as designed. It is in fact intended behavior. You taught the system what to look for. And now it can take that and it can apply that to other people's selfies. So if you put your selfie up there and you happen to not be white, it's going to say, oh, well, obviously, based off of the data that I have learned from, the way to make you more attractive is to make you whiter. So this is the kind of problem that we then see getting kind of inserted into technology and then reinserting itself over and over again and can cause some really big issues. And it is all over when it comes to anything related to images, when it comes to facial recognition. For example, we can go all the way back to 2015 when uh, this delightful example happened. So this is from Google Photos. And at the time, Google Photos had launched a brand new feature. And what that feature did is it would auto tag your images. So it would go through your images and based off of the, um, based off of the, um, photo, uh, recognition AI that it had built. So they had all these algorithms they'd gone through, they had looked at what all of these images were of, and they learned, right? And they could go, okay, that's a cat, that's a bicycle. And then what it thought was that this guy Jackie and his friend were gorillas. Gorillas is an extremely racially loaded word. It's a, it, it's a slur, right? And it's like, this word paired with those people made this make the news. And it wasn't just that it was this one photo. It was actually an entire set of photos they took that day. So they took these whole, they were at like an outdoor festival and they took all these selfies. And so he had just uploaded them all because they were all just in his Google Photos account, right? So it's like every photo they snapped that day, all tagged as gorillas. The system just kept getting it wrong. Now, because it happened to get it wrong in this particularly sensitive way, this was all over the media. But what I think is really interesting about this is, of course, why the system got it wrong. So when the Google team noted that this had happened, they apologized, they were horrified, and they, they actually uh, revealed a little bit about what was happening. This was in a tweet that Jonathan Zunger, who used to work at Google, um, and was, was like a chief architect of this project, he actually said to Jackie, the, the fellow this had happened to, he said, you know, we're going to fix it. He apologized. He said, you know, we're going to fix this. We're going to work on longer term fixes around both linguistics, so words to be careful about in photos of people, and image recognition itself, e.g. better recognition of dark-skinned faces. And I think that that's really telling, right? It's like, what you're saying is you launched a product out into the world that was less good at identifying dark-skinned faces than white faces, right? Like, you have to get better at it now because you launched a product that was bad at that. And nowhere along the way did anybody say, wait a second, maybe we can't have a product that, go to, that goes to market that can't actually identify the faces of people of color. Like maybe we're Google and we're try trying to serve a massive audience. <laughs> like maybe this isn't going to work. Like that never came up or it came up and nobody listened. And so, um, in fact, 
Now, this keeps happening over and over again, and people are starting to research it. There is a researcher, uh, Joy Bolawamne, at the MIT Media Lab, and she did a study um, recently looking at a lot of the facial recognition data sets and looking at um, how often things were going right or wrong. This is a quote from the New York Times, and they, they wrote an article about it. They said, when the photo is of a white man, the software is right 99% of the time. The darker the skin, the more errors arise up to nearly 35% for images of darker skinned women. So basically, again, the darker the skin, the more errors. They were able to quantify that. And the reason they were able to quantify that is they were also looking at um, where this data was coming from. And so in one of the really popular data sets, they found that the, uh, the data set used to assess performance was 77% male and 83% white. So, the researchers at a major US technology company claimed their accuracy rate was 97%, but they were only testing it on white guys, vast majority. So you don't know that you're gonna get it wrong because you're not bothering to see if it works for people who aren't a very narrow segment of the population. And I think a lot, like how does this happen? Like how can you do that, right? Like how are you still making these mistakes? But you know, failing to design for people of color is simply not new. Um, way back in the 50s, Kodak actually started sending out these kits. So at the time, you used to, in the US, you had to go to um, like a Kodak branded lab to get your film developed. And so you would take your film in and a Kodak person would actually handle it. In the 50s, they started letting uh, like mom and pop shops open, right? And so you could become like a small independent photo lab. And they would send these kits out to make sure that you were developing the Kodak film correctly. They sent these kits that they called Shirley cards. This is one of them. And a Shirley card was meant to help you calibrate things like skin tone and shadow and light. And they sent them out for years. And every single one of them, year after year, fashions would change, right? The women who were in the pictures would change. The first one was actually named Shirley. After that, they were just called Shirley. But every single time, there were a couple things that were consistent. She was always white. She was always labeled as normal. In fact, it wasn't until the 1970s that this started to change. And the reason that it started to change is that um, furniture makers and chocolate manufacturers started uh, complaining that Kodak film was not developing correctly to show the different variations in wood grain and chocolate types. And so that is what actually got Kodak interested in changing their product to make it develop film more effectively. Because the thing is, um, this isn't really an issue of like a technical ability. It's an issue of choice. There's a black photographer wrote about this really beautifully in, in BuzzFeed a while ago. She said, you know, with a white body as a light meter, all other skin tones become deviations from the norm. Again, right, we're getting back to this sense of normal. Who and what is normal that's incredibly narrow? and that leaves out a huge percentage of people. And it all comes down to choices that we're making about who's in and who's out. And you know, I think about this a lot in the context of everything that is happening, um, maybe particularly in America, but I would say in the world, um, where we are starting to talk, I mean, we have conversations almost every day in the United States about things like white supremacy and like sort of like rise of alt-rights, neo-Nazis, right? And like, they're, they're there and they're, <laughs> prominent on Twitter and they're holding rallies. But I look at this and I think like, yes, but also this is also what white supremacy looks like. Because what that literally means, right? Like the, what white supremacy literally means is saying white people are more important. So if you launch a product and that product works better for white people than non-white people, you've launched a white supremacist product. Which is like a pretty shitty thing to feel, I think. Like if you have to sit and think about that for a while, that probably doesn't feel great. But I really think it's important to talk about it in those terms because I think that it is important to recognize that we have a lot of responsibility for the things that we put out into the world. Particularly that so many things that we are designing, so many things that are being built in the tech industry are starting to be involved in all of these systems that we can't necessarily see, we don't necessarily know how they work, but that have huge effects on people's lives. I'm gonna talk about one of them. It is software that's being used in the United States on people like these guys. So on your left, um, you have Bernard Parker, and in January of 2013, he was arrested in Broward County, Florida. 
He possessed marijuana. On your right, you have Dylan Fugit. Now, Dylan was arrested in the same place, Broward County, Florida, a month later, and he was 23 years old. He possessed cocaine. Now, both of them had a prior record. So Bernard had been arrested before um, for resisting arrest without violence. So he had been like running from the police and then they ended up arresting him. Dylan had been arrested before for attempted burglary. But according to a piece of software that's being used in courts all over the United States, these guys are not similar at all because COMPASS, which stands for Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions, which uses an algorithm to predict the likelihood that somebody's going to commit a future crime, decided that Bernard was a 10, so the highest risk that there is for recidivism. And Dylan was only considered a three. Now, since then, um, Dylan has been arrested multiple more times on drug charges, and Bernard has not been arrested again at all. And it's not just these two guys who got these dramatically different scores, of course. So ProPublica, which does um, public service journalism, they did a big investigation into this software. And they found, so Compass, which is made by a private company called North Point, and like I said, it's used in courts all over the United States. They found that it was dramatically, dramatically different for people of different races. It's not just that the system would get it wrong, it's the way it got it wrong. It's very telling. Because you see, what it did is it would uh, routinely label people who were considered high risk but then did not reoffend. I'm sorry, it would routinely um, have people who were labeled high risk and did not reoffend be. Words. Can I blame jet lag still? I got here on Sunday. So. <laughs> So it would routinely show that if you were black and you were labeled as high risk and you did not reoffend, you would still have a high score, right? So like it was getting it wrong by giving you a high score and then you didn't go on and reoffend. So the system thought you were high risk and you, you weren't, right? But conversely, if you were white, it was much more likely to get it wrong the other direction to say, oh, you must be low risk and then to have you go off and reoffend in the future. So. What it means is that the system was wrong for these different groups about the same percentage of the time, but only one group was basically taking on that error and the other group was benefiting from it. So if you were white and you got a lower score, you were more likely to get released with lower bond, so pay less money to get out of jail. You were more likely to maybe get a lesser sentence because in some states this is used for sentencing. And if you're black, you're more likely to get a high score to be treated as a high-risk criminal, even if you weren't. And this is happening in dozens of states, right? It's happening in Broward County, Florida, but it's also happening all over the United States. These algorithmically determined scores are being used to decide whether somebody can get out on bond or not, how much that bond will be, and in a bunch of states, whether they are what how, how heavy their sentence will be. Now, one of the things that's really interesting about this particular piece of software is that um, some researchers went back and looked at these scores after ProPublica had this investigation. So there's some folks from computer science who are really interested in algorithmic fairness, and they went in and looked at what was going on, and they found that actually it's a problem. <laughs> the problem is that you can't have it both ways, which is to say, if you decide that fairness is that people with the same risk score, like a seven, have the same risk of recidivism, which is for both groups is like 70%, then you cannot also make it the same across races if you have one race that is uh, arrested more often or is more likely to, to be put into the software system than another. In the United States, we incarcerate a huge percentage of black people. And so if those base rates are different, you cannot be fair in both ways at the same time. It's not mathematically impossible to do. And so what had happened is that effectively the people who made the software had decided what fairness meant, right? They decided that fairness meant if you got a seven and you got a seven, you were roughly equivalently likely to reoffend. But they hadn't looked at who was going to take on sort of the, the unfairness of the algorithm as their burden. They hadn't looked at who this was going to affect worse. They hadn't looked at like when they're wrong, who was going to take that. And the thing is, it's also, it's not just that issue. It's not just about a question of sort of like, what is fair in the algorithm. It's also a question of like, how do they decide these scores? Because if you remember, we talked about two guys who had pretty different, or sorry, pretty similar backgrounds and pretty different scores, right? So like, how did that happen? 
Well, there's 167 different questions that go into the compass score. And uh, here are a few of them. Is there a lot of crime in your neighborhood? Did your parent ever go to jail? How often do you have contact with your family? Have you moved a lot? Is it easy to buy drugs in your neighborhood? Have you ever been suspended or expelled from school? Now, there's actually a lot of studies that show um, that in the US, uh, students of color, and particularly black students, are much more likely to be suspended or expelled for the same behavior that white students are not suspended or expelled from. So you think about it, right? It's like, OK, so if you have a school system that will be more likely to punish people of color more severely at a young age, and then they fill out this questionnaire later on in life, and they are punished more severely because they had more severe unfair punishment earlier on and it perpetuates the cycle, right? But they're not looking at it that way. They're looking at it as like, well, we're trying to figure out the answer to whether this person is risky or not. And so there's 167 questions that go into this. There's also a lot of questions about like how that data is collected because sometimes it's an interview, sometimes they infer answers, who knows what's happening at a police station when you're arrested. But these are, these are the kinds of factors that they're using. <laughs> I think of this all of the time because I think of this as sort of like the worst case scenario for what happens when people like us assume that things that are technical are also somehow neutral. That just because we're dealing with things like algorithms, just because we're working with data, that somehow that does not have sort of political or cultural or social, social, social bias to it, right? Like when we assume that things that are technical are neutral, we let all kinds of bias seep in. And what actually happens is that the algorithm does not eliminate the bias, which is often how these are sold, right? Like the reason that you buy software for your court system to use is because you don't want judges to make inconsistent decisions, otherwise known as bias decisions. So you get the software because that's going to remove that inconsistency from the judges, right? But they don't actually get rid of the bias. What they do is they outsource it. And when I say outsource it, what I mean is that it makes it like, oh, it's not, I didn't choose to do this. The system did. The computer says you're a 10, right? So we can kind of outsource our blame. We can outsource, we, it feels like we can outsource sort of our culpability for the answers. But the bias is still there. And I think about this as we look at all of the different ways that um, algorithms and that machine learning are being used in so many different facets of life. So for example, there's a system called word to vec word to vec is, um, it is a, um, um, sorry, it is a, a, a base of um, three million words that have been pulled from Google News articles. And um, what machine learning folks have done is they've created this like network of meanings and codings of these words, right, to show like what the different words mean and how they relate to each other. And so what it does is it actually looks for analogies. So it's basically it's like a different way to do some parts of natural language processing. So what they do is they take word to vec and they use that with other natural language processing tools to do a better job of understanding how we speak, right? And um, what word to vec can do is it can answer analogies like um, Paris is to France as Tokyo is to blank. And it knows the answer to that is Japan. And it also knows like, you know, man is to king as woman is to queen. But it also comes back with some interesting analogies like this. Man is to computer programmer as woman is to homemaker. Here's why it does that. Three million words from Google News articles. So in those Google News articles, what it looked at is like where these words and words that it could figure out were similar to these words or had relationships to these words, where they fell in relation to other things made it clear to the system that they were being used in very similar ways, in equivalent ways. Well, yeah, because Google News articles is not like an unbiased source or like a neutral source of words, right? I mean, it's, it's words from publications of all stripes, right? From all over the, the world, different publications. It's going to show things like the titles that people have, like, oh, okay, we interviewed so-and-so, a homemaker. We interviewed so-and-so, a computer programmer. And so if you look at that and you think about, like, well, yeah, okay, historically, we're going to have more homemakers in the data set who are women. We're going to have more computer programmers that are men. It's like, okay, yeah, I see how that would happen, right? But this is a fundamentally different kind of answer than, like, um, Paris, France, and, and Tokyo, Japan, right? Those are facts. This is not a fact. This is just an inference that it's made. But if these things go unchecked, 
you take technology like this, you use it in a larger natural language processing package, that package gets picked up by some other tech company that's embedding that to do their natural language processing for whatever the hell else they're building, and suddenly all kinds of biases that you have no idea about might be underlying whatever it is that you're using or you're making. And so if we don't talk about this, if we don't like actively do the work of like questioning where these things are coming from, we will continue to embed and reinforce biases over and over and over again. For example, another one is a, an image set called Coco. So Coco is a project initially run by Microsoft and co-sponsored by Facebook and a startup named Mighty AI. And what they did is they labeled 100,000 images from the web. And then they trained an AI on it. And that AI learned that kitchen implements should be tagged with the word women. Right? Because, because it was looking at the data that it was given. It learns from the data that it's given. And if you don't ask tough questions about that data, then you end up with biased answers. And once again, you start using this kind of technology to build other things on top of it without questioning that data or without testing it with a broad range of people. And what do you think is going to happen? Well, you'll end up with like more faux pas like Google had with its Google Images, right? So what do we do about these kinds of things? Well, a lot. There's a, there's a lot to be done in tech right now. But I think one of the very first things is to like really rethink what it is that we think our jobs are. I think that we've spent a lot of time um, very much kind of like glamorizing first, I would say, tech skills. And now maybe also I see a lot of that with design skills. Or there's sort of like a lot of uh, maybe romanticizing what we do. And I think that a lot of times that results in some thinking that anything else is sort of like a lesser skill or isn't important. In fact, this is what I was so upset about when I read the Google memo. I mean, there's a lot of things I was upset about when I read the Google memo last year. I don't know if all of you read it, but it was like this 10-page memo outlining the ways in which, like, well, there are fewer women in programming because they're just not as good at it. There's a, some tenuous, tenuous uh, science involved with his argument there. Um, but in this memo, one of the things that James Damore, the author, said, he said that Google needed to do, this was like a, his recommendation to Google, he said, de-emphasize empathy. Being emotionally unengaged helps us better reason about the facts. There is not a damn one of the problems that I've identified tonight that would be fixed by us being less engaged with empathy, being less engaged emotionally, right? Like, these are not problems that we are going to solve if we think that what we're doing is reasoning about facts. The reality is that most of what we're doing is not actually about facts, it's about people. And so we have to ask a lot of other questions, right? Like, if we are emotionally unengaged reasoning about facts, who's deciding what fair means? Like, that's a really hard question. I would not want to be the only person left to decide what fairness is. But if you're going to design software that's going to decide something like whether somebody's going to have a high risk score if they've been arrested, or in a more day to day way, like, are you going to get a loan or not, right? Like, ma mathematical models are being used for all of that kind of stuff as well. It's like, who gets to decide what fairness is? How do we decide what fairness is? Do we feel equipped to have, like, a random engineer decide what fairness is? We don't. Also, what about historical context? So, for example, when we talk about something like housing, you know, the United States has this long history of a practice called redlining. Are any of you familiar with the, the term redlining? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's fascinating and awful. So effectively what was done for years is banks would draw like a line around neighborhoods that they decided they didn't want to um, lend money to buy houses in. Those neighborhoods just happened to be neighborhoods where black people lived. And they would say that those are high risk areas and you couldn't get a traditional loan there. And so what would happen is that then those neighborhoods would end up going to non-traditional lenders that would charge exorbitant rates or have all these non-traditional loans and oftentimes those people would end up getting their houses taken away from them. And so what you end up with is, right, is these cycles of like you, you don't have access to the traditional financial market, then you can never actually like get a leg up. And so then over and over again, you have these cycles of poverty. And, um, and so, okay, if you don't understand redlining, right? Like if you're working in the United States and you're going to work on a model that's going to make decisions about whether somebody can get a mortgage, and those decisions include zip code data, you have to understand this. Like somebody involved in this process needs to be thinking about this, right? But oftentimes nobody is because that's not really a job. Like that's, that's not an engineer's job. 
And in fact, I actually would really argue, you know, I think one of the big problems that we have is like, we'll often expect to just sort of like outsource the empathy to the UX person on the team. And like, and like that's going to be good enough. Um, and I think UX people are, I mean, like it's, what it, you know, it's, UX is great. But to, to, to think that like all of the stuff that involves thinking about people can be limited to a single role is very limited. And also thinking that it can be a role that doesn't have deep, deep, like actual knowledge and like training in some of these specific subjects, I think is, is very misguided. And then like, how do we anticipate unintended consequences? A lot of what we're dealing with right now is unintended consequences in technology. And so have we thought about how do we deal with those? Reasoning about the facts, it's not gonna do it. Anil Dash has written a bit about what he thinks of as being kind of crucial to technologists next, which is professionalizing. He says, you know, you look at somebody who goes to law school, business school, journalism school, medical school, they have a professional society that sets standards, and if you don't meet them, you can be disbarred, you can lose your medical license, you can get the highest credential computer science degree from the most august institutions with essentially having had zero ethics training. And that is, in fact, the most likely path to getting funded as a successful startup in Silicon Valley. People look around and they think, like, that's not relevant, right? Like, well, we don't really care about that. What are you going to do with that? Why would you study that? And so rethinking sort of the skill sets that we need on our teams, the skill sets that we need to each of us individually have, what we need to value, how we value it, I think is a crucial piece to starting to fix some of these problems. And then there's a big piece of it that's uncovering the assumptions that we have in our work, right? Like uncovering where it is that we've made an assumption that reveals a lot of bias about ourselves, but probably very little about our audience. So for example, if we go back to you know Eric's example back, um, with year in review, these are just a couple of uh, ways that that particular product broke, right? So there was his, which is really tragic, but also like here's a guy with his apartment on fire, um, lots of people dealing with death and grieving. Well, we can start to unpack assumptions that were made in the course of designing this feature. And we can start saying like, okay, well, oh, are you familiar with this phrase? <laughs> I, this, is like a, this is like the most dad joke. This is definitely like a dad joke that I learned from my dad. When you assume, um, so, but the assumptions that went into this, right? Users care about the same things I care about, or my advice is right for this user. Users are gonna understand what I mean. Like all of these kinds of assumptions that get built in. When you look at that particular failure, it's like people have had a good experience. People want to relive their year. Right? Like those are the assumptions that we are making. So what are the assumptions that we're building into our products day after day without ever thinking about it, without ever stopping and realizing it? And then finally, we need to consider the most vulnerable people first. This is a, a fundamental concept, I think, in the, in the way that I like to look at my work now that hadn't really occurred to me before. Um, when I first started working with Eric Meyer, so we, we wrote a little book together called Design for Real Life a couple years ago, and we started talking about changing, um, changing thinking from talking about uh, edge cases, so like the stuff that's on the fringes and you don't have to worry about it, to calling them stress cases and saying like, okay, if you move this to the center of your work, then you can make sure that it's going to work for the people who need it the most. And I think that we have to think about this, right? Like, if we're not thinking about the most vulnerable people first in our work, then those people, those needs will never be met. If you think about them first, probably everybody else is kind of relatively safe and secure. Most of their needs are going to get met. There's a book called uh, 50 Inventions That Shape the Modern Economy that a friend of mine recommended. One of the things the author talks about in it is how when a new technology emerges, we should ask, who will win and who will lose as a result? When you launch a new piece of software that could affect somebody's future, who's going to win and who's going to lose? Who's going to get the benefit and who's going to get the short end of the stick? And we also need to question where everything is coming from. What is the source of the information that we have? So, um, for example, we look at all those algorithms we talked about before, right? And so many of the problems there are like we were relying on data sets that nobody had thought about. Nobody thought about whether the data set was good or like what a good data set was. So it's where did it come from and when did it come from? If we're relying on historical data, what's the history of that data? What does it mean to rely on historical data? What criteria was used to decide it? 
Were there other data sources that we chose not to use? And why did we choose not to use them? Are there things that we excluded from our data set? And if we hadn't excluded that, would that have changed how this thing works? Who decided criteria? Like, how, who gets to decide what good means, right? Like, who gets to decide that this is functioning as desired? How do we even know if this is working? So, right, so when I mentioned um, the MIT Media Lab and the, the study that was done there, they talked about how, like, yeah, if you only test whether it's working by showing it to other people who work down the hall, and they're like, yep, facial recognition works great for me, and all of those people happen to also look like you, you haven't tested it, right? Like, you haven't tested it effectively. So we have to question all of these sources of our data and all of the ways that's being processed. And we need to really ask tough questions of the companies that we work for, and companies we work with, and the companies we create. I think this is tough to do. I know, you know, like a lot of you, you're not necessarily in a position where you can go in and like bang on a CEO's door and say like, we've got some ethical considerations to make here. But I think it's important that we start talking about this and start pushing on this. And particularly if you're in a position of leadership to start asking like, what are the values and the mission that we say we have? And what does that mean? Like, what, do, what would that actually mean if we had of like more radically human-centered product? What would it mean for us to really live out the values that we say we have? What happens when there's conflict? Like, I have certainly talked to organizations who, who want to do good and who have people who are meaning to do good, but the reality is that every time there's a question about like, well, if we do this, probably it's gonna not work for some people and it might be harmful to them, but, it performs, it's good for engagement, so we're gonna do it anyway. Look, if every time there's a question between like your ethics and whatever your metric is, and the metric always wins, you don't actually have ethics. Like they don't exist, right? Like if you don't actually follow them, you don't have them. And so I think we have to really get serious in our companies about agreeing on what these things mean. And, and actually saying, like, how are we going to live this out? And what are we going to do when we are being pushed to do something that doesn't align with who we say we are? And so the last thing I'll leave you all with is that, you know, I think the more power you feel like you have in your organization, in your professional community, the more secure you are, the more stable you are, the bigger the responsibility that you have. And so if you're coming to this from a place where you feel like you are secure in your job, you are secure in your professional community, then I really encourage you to make this something that you talk about publicly and openly. It was not necessarily easy for me to get to a place where this is what I do. Um, it was actually very scary. And there were a lot of times when I um, would hear from people that, you know, well, tech is an unpolitical place. Like, this shouldn't be about politics. This should be about, like, we're just focused on doing good work. And what I realize is that, you know, we're not capable of doing good work unless we talk about what good is. And so if you feel like you are in a place of security, I really encourage you to speak up. And thank you so much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. Get back.